Good afternoon, guys. My name is Vinod. Um, as you all know, I'm the admin of the Financial Freedom um, Telegram group. Thanks for joining us today. This is our first ever Financial Freedom Investing Insights interview or podcast, how you want to consider this. Um, special thanks to Dr. Venkatesh Karthik, who has volunteered to share his investment insights and his journey with us all today for the next um, 60 minutes or so. So without further ado, welcome everyone and welcome Dr. Karthik. Yeah, thanks Vinod and I'm really privileged and I'm grateful to Vinod and the rest of you for giving me a chance to share uh, my experience and my journey. And as I've always mentioned earlier, uh, journey is basically learning. It's collective learning for all of us and we all have to contribute and constructively uh, move forward in terms of this uh, journey towards financial freedom, whether we achieve it or not, as I was telling the other day is immaterial, but we should at least enjoy the journey and try to be uh, free of the shackles of uh, a weight slave. At least half of uh, your discretionary expenses should be funded in a non-guilty way by your own efforts. Well, I would not call it passive income like everyone likes to call it because there's nothing passive about it. It's hard work and it's actively seeking passive income as I would like to put it. Yeah, nice, nicely put. I guess many of our listeners and our members would relate to that, to that mindset and, and the intentions as well. Um, uh, Dr. Karthik, could you explain, maybe share with us about um, how did you get started in this investing? Because that's yeah. this general that's this general belief, isn't there, about doctors aren't good with money. Um, the fact is this. that doctors are probably going to be good with money if they put their mind and act to it. That would be a more apt way of saying it. As regards me, I started in a very uh, stuttered manner, but quite early, uh, at least the start, although I made a lot of mistakes, I will tell you. My first investment was when I was a medical student with my pocket money, when I was in my anatomy physiology part two. Mm. That was the time when Morgan Stanley opened up their first open-ended mutual fund in India. To be honest, I did not get my head around what I was investing in, but I saw that there was a frenzy. And I still remember uh, applying for that in the hope of making windfall gains because I did not understand mutual funds. Not that I uh, was alone, but majority didn't. Mm. The issue price was the at par issue at 10 rupees. The allotment came through and I sold it at 1340, I still remember, in the Madras Stock Exchange. Mm. And I was elated with the 320 odd rupees after commission for the 100 odd units. So that's how I started. And then there was a gap of around two years. And this time I was in my ophthalmology preventive medicine type posting. When I ganged up with my friend who happens to be from Salem incidentally and is a leading ophthalmologist in Chennai. And both of us invested thousand thousand rupees each. Once again, we are not earning, but we are scrounging savers and bought into two mutual funds, which was the Alliance 95 mutual fund. And now it is still up and running as a Birla Sun Life and now it's Birla Sun Life, whatever it is called. Mm. That was an investment of thousand rupees, which is worth about two lakhs now. And we are talking about a 25 year time frame. Right. It was probably unintentional that we left it like that. But when I got mind of the fact, which was 15 years ago, I told my friend, by God's grace, both of us are earning and so we don't need to go and redeem. Let us see what happens. And after 25 years, it has grown so many times. So 1,000 rupees has become 2 lakhs. So the 2,000 that we invested together became 4 lakhs. Mm. Around the same time was when many mistakes were committed. And that was my first mistake. The first mistake, I would say, was to get involved in the IPOs. The IPOs of companies, which are basically hit and run frauds when SEBI wasn't regulating things properly in the mid 90s. There used to be 
reams of application forms, paper application forms lying outside the State Bank of India branch opposite the Madras Beach uh, station, the railway station. And me and my friend, my friend was probably half hearted. He didn't understand even half of what I knew, but he faithfully followed me because I made some money for him. And we used to collect those forms, fill up checks and go and stand with all the trading community people and apply. At that time, multiple applications were allowed and the people who had money used to apply in large amounts and they used to sell and make a killing at allotment. That is still continuing in India in a modified form now. But the mistake that I did was I did not have enough money to apply for good issues which were placed above par. And I went for many of the poor quality, 10, 10 rupees issues, made some but lost much. This sort of made me a bit wary. And then after that, I went to Mumbai for my post-graduation and my investing journey temporarily stopped, but only temporarily until two, three years. And I had decided to come to the UK, but I had no money and I come from a lower middle class background and I'm never ashamed to say that. So I had to earn my own money for the lab, and therefore I restarted my investment journey. This time much wiser in the year 1997, as soon as I finished my MBBS and started to invest in equity mutual funds at that point of time. And apart from the original Birla, there were Sundaram and there was also the HDFC stable just coming along and the unit trust of India's grandmaster and master share, which could be bought and sold on the stock exchanges and things like that. And subsequently in 2000, when I left for the UK, just before the internet uh, bust happened, God helped me and I needed the money and I sold off all my mutual funds, redeeming everything except what I told you at the beginning, making a good 25, 30,000 rupee profit, which was a big amount for me in the year 2000 and went to the UK. Again, as you all know, and many of you might relate to my experience, the minute you land in the UK, everything you have to divide and multiply by 70 and 75, and you become really, really risk averse without a job in a foreign country. And for the next seven to eight years until 2008, I did not invest at all, but just kept quiet. And at that time, my savings were channelized into buying my property in Leeds. And as I always say on the forum, that property is always a very good diversifier. So the real journey to cut the long journey short is started in, in the year 2008 was inspired by one sentinel event. And that event was the Macondo disaster when the BP uh, thing burst in the waters of Texas. And I saw BP shares plummeting before my eyes from 550 pence to 250 pence and 260 pence. And then my original, uh, you know, the spirit came back and I bought BP for 320 pence and I hold that share even now. Since so, 2008, so, so I have- although you, weren't, although you weren't actively invested, you kept an eye on the market then? I didn't keep an eye on the market between 2000 and 2007 because I was busy with my exams, uh, got married, family, buying house and all that. I have to be honest in that seven years taking my eye off the ball, was probably a mistake in retrospect, although uh, that money came handy in going for it. I think of it this way, that God helped me because had I gone into the stock market, I would have lost heavily in the global financial crisis of 2008 with all the money gone, as many seniors I know. So yeah. it was a blessing in disguise. Since 2008, yeah. I learned to maximize my ISA allowances in the UK every year. And until 2014, Every year without fail, I made sure that the 15,000 or 17,000 limit, I somehow managed to fill. And to this day, my UK investments are all within the ISA wrapper except for a few thousands. Mm -hmm. And that journey continues even now. And can I, can I um, maybe check with you how it started even before that first uh, mutual fund you invested as a medical student? Because um, not many of us, when we are medical students, know about stock market or mutual funds. Um, did you have any kind of exposure growing up as a child? 
uh, with your father or other people kind of talking about investing um, on the stock market or mutual funds, or is it just a brand new kind of thing that you picked up as a medical, medical graduate? That's a very good question you asked. And the fact is that I am the first investor in my whole family on either side. And therefore, there was nobody in the family or anything like that. But for everything, there should be a trigger. And there was a trigger in that there was a sub broker who had opened this office in a very obscure corner of Chennai where I hail from. And I used to wonder what is he doing? And I didn't understand half of the words when I was in uh, uh, medical college first year. Mm. But then because I know the area well, I one day crept up and then saw a few people waiting there. At that point of time, individual stock exchanges functioned. And at around 6.30, I saw two or three guys pacing up and down as if their wife is going to deliver a baby in front of the <laughs> sub broker's office. One of them, I didn't know, but I know his friend. And then I asked him and he said, this is a broker's office. They are waiting for share prices. So one day I was bold enough and went and introduced myself and then saw the same white forms, which I had uh, seen outside the beach station was lying around. And then the messenger came with a sheet and the four of them were about to pounce literally to tear that sheet into pieces. And then they say, what is that? Then they said, quotation has come. And that was the quotation from the Madras Stock Exchange showing the cyclo styled prices of everything from A to N. And then they were all talking, Bombay market, what happened? Tomorrow, oh, so then tomorrow this will fall. Like for Madras market used to blindly follow the Bombay market. So mm -hmm. when I saw all that, and then I picked up courage and they talked with a couple of people. They say they watch this every day. And I saw the same faces turn up every day. So mm -hmm. that triggered it. And then when Morgan Stanley came, uh, then I picked up the courage and then decided we should do something about it. Yeah. I think I think that's that's a great story. The couple of pointers I picked up in your in your experience was being curious and willing to learn. And, and the pick up the courage, I think, uh, even once you get to know stuff, having that courage to take that first step, um, uh, I think I think that has that has got you into this journey. Um, one of the things that you've been very good in helping out with our members in, in the chat sections are um, about your investment thesis. So you have a particular approach towards it. Um, and I, I have a particular approach. I'm more growth stock oriented, um, trading and investing. And you you have a, a really rounded approach and a lot of people are quite um, uh, interested to know about it and also kind of attracted towards that. Could you talk a little bit about what's your investment thesis and how did you come up to that particular um, style of investing? Yeah, so in terms of a style, I have predominantly been a dividend investor. I wouldn't call myself as a value investor, but I am a predominant dividend investor. And the reason why I became a dividend investor is I believe and still do believe at least uh, partially that the key to financial freedom is to actively seek passive income, which in essence means that you are now a wage slave and you shall perennially remain a wage slave unless you get something which is at least comparable to some of your expenses or matches it. I began to think about it on this line. Oh my God, this dividend divided by 12 is my monthly water bill. Oh, this dividend divided by 12 has paid for my gas bill. This dividend divided by 12 will probably pay for maybe buying coffee every day in the canteen. This sort of an approach percolated down my mind. And at that point of time, I happened to stumble upon a website which some of you might be familiar, which I would not recommend now after all these years, called lemonfool.co.uk. Lemonfool lemonfool.co.uk benefited from that but i was also handicapped by in getting influenced under it so in the lemonfool.co.uk there is a high dividend or dividend strategy section wherein different bloggers most of whom i must confess are retired people uh, speak volumes about dividend investing so that 
made me get into it more i have to say that 10 years ago things were very different and before the tech era the darlings of the british stock market were the dividend kings or the dividend aristocrats i would call them which rolled out dividends steadily year after the year year after the year and it was a good feeling to get that cash coming into your coffers so my predominant style was dividend investing but then i realized after a couple of dividend cuts and bad experiences in the early 2013 2012 phase i will talk about my mistakes and i'll qualify them i started to get into dividend growth investing one of the companies which kept typifies dividend growth at least at that time was unilever because their volumes grew along with their dividends and their dividends were well covered by free cash flow to the ratio of 1.8 to 2 so predominant dividend investing has been my style evolving now to dividend growth and now after the covid crisis from last year i have started to very gingerly thread into the field of growth investing although i must confess that i am not not fully in it as but i will exemplify subsequently as to what i am doing and my approach to that as well i guess this nicely leads on to us um thinking about the the approach you, you spoke about how you got interest in the dividend and then now dividend growth investing how do you keep up with um building up initially how did you build up your knowledge and skills in that area and and subsequently how do you kind of maintain and keep track of uh, what's going on the initial bit was basically by showing some interest in knowing about the company and its company product and uh, the internet era is truly upon us and therefore there was uh, no problems on that front let's give an example of one company to show how i started just one single company one single company out would be national grid mm. well we all know one of the most boring shares of the footsie 100 but most reliable and i got interested in national grid because of its uh, dividends at that point of time and i wanted to know what is national grid and uh, the only national grid i knew is that the in pediatrics we have something called grid training for sub specialty and i was one of the grid trainees so i said what grid grid then i realized that it does something like steadily supplying electricity steadily distributing gas and i started to read about it and then the more i read about it it was extremely boring but i know that the company had a wide moat which is very very safe in that it's not easy to replicate or duplicate it or replace it so that piqued my interest in national grid and i started to read about it and then i did not understand the nomenclature like the price book ratio price earnings eps etc for which i started to google and then did it once i got the initial grasp of what these numbers mean then i started to show more interest in uh, that sort of a thing as regards other companies i came to realize over the next 5 to 7 years after making several mistakes that this model of national grid cannot be replicated across industries and for that matter even across different companies in the same sector this is a mistake i made and i have learned it now and that was how i started to read about it and then as regards keeping up and following that's real hard work and that's meticulously going through the summary of the quarterly reports or the half yearly reports and also trying to read unbiased views what do i mean by unbiased views you might remember that i would say please don't look at motley fool as such because today mr a will write good about a company the same afternoon mr b write something else i don't blame mr a or mr b i would only blame myself if i relied on a or b rather i should try to find out and develop some knowledge and insight myself so unbiased reviews are basically only going to be got when you have somebody who has either minimum bias or is some source wherein you can rely on it which places just facts so fact versus opinion i go only by fact and then i form my opinion but this would need 
repeated googling reading the reports every three monthly what happened to national grid let's give one example using the same company a few months ago in may 2021 many of you may or may not have heard that national grid acquired western power which supplies electricity which supplies a lot of uh, gas and other things in the west of england and that was going to be blocked by the competition commission as a possibility although i knew it won't happen then i read about western power and then you need to find out the rationale of their move then the same national grid i'll give you another example this would be the article and the article reads like this tariff price determination for the next 5 years with the assured rate of internal return has been fixed national grid proposes appeal what a dry topic it is but you need to read what it is it sounds so dry when you read you know that it says that for the next 5 years the government has allowed this much minimum profit for national grid and that is a good news for you because it gives you what's called earnings visibility so earnings visibility for a utility company is very very important and now final example with the same national grid was something which happened 2 years ago 60% of national grid's revenue comes from the us not from the uk although it's listed here it's dually listed as ngg and tra trades on the nyse and now immediately you get a feel aha that's good 60% out of britain anything out of britain is always good for me because it gives you diversification plus dollar stream of earnings these are like in integral calculus different parts of the equation coming together robust source of revenue from northeast usa robust source of revenue from guaranteed 5 years at least till 2027 and western power acquisition albeit a bit overpaid okay so these three things give me confidence in holding on to ng.l which has been under were with me for the last 11 years and i'll talk to you more about when i exemplify the returns from this so this is how you keep up it's dry it's hard work it's very very boring but for somebody who believes in sunil gavaskar style which is me i have no option i need to say off the pace bowlers yeah, um, that speaks the uh, the era of cricket followers. Um, for for me, it was draw it. Um, I, I think I can relate relate to you on that. And I suppose that reflects what you meant at the beginning as active passive investing. So you have to do this kind of regular kind of uh, updates on the uh, earnings report and the company specific news and the policy changes and how it impacts on your on your investments. Um, right. And are there any particular um, websites you depend on for, for this or any particular um, newspaper where you kind of get this unbiased news um, or, or the, um, the websites of the, the investor relationship kind of website page of the companies? How do you, how do you go about it? Yeah, so in this regard, to get just a gist of summary about these major British companies which are dividend payers, I just go to Lemon Pool, Lemon Fool, and there is a very, very nice gentleman called Mr. I.D. or Ian Pickering, who is a, a very, very long-term dividend investor, who dutifully summarizes every quarterly result of all the British dividend companies and gives it in bullet points, one, two, three, four, making my life easy. And you see that meticulously done by him. He's a retired gentleman from uh, uh, North Yorkshire. So that is uh, very helpful. But other way is the website is to either go on your own broker's website, Halifax or Hargreaves Lansdowne. And in that you will see the quarterly results summarized. And if you want a bit more of a qualitative feel to it, uh, the analysts who are employed by uh, Hargreaves Lansdowne will summarize the company results uh, for the British companies, at least the big companies. If you want it more unbiased, you have to go on the London Stock Exchange website wherein it's mandatory for them to declare the results and you need to read about it. Apart from this, if you want a qualitative unbiased view, it's very difficult to get. Even my views are biased. So I would say my view, if I talked about National Grid, 
please take it with a pinch of salt because what is making me happy about national grid may not necessarily be the same for you you may not be happy for one or two reasons or you may not be happy with the pedestrian returns if you uh, deem that as very modest so i would say that please take facts and you form your own opinion we are not going to be foolproof but relying on any other source of information introduces bias this is for the uk stocks the us stocks is something which i have started doing only since last year and i'll tell you before that in the uk i used to do the us stocks but since i was a dividend investor i was really really upset that the withholding tax is eating into my returns and being a dividend investor it doesn't make any sense in my opinion to go and invest in us stocks let me give a good example great company coca cola right every year it has increased dividends for 60 years 70 years right very good what does it mean it means that every quarter i will get only 70% of the dividend with 30% just lost to the tax man for no fault of mine except that i am a non us resident how does it affect returns i cannot be modest and say oh only a small amount instead of 10 dollars i am getting 7 dollars the fact is that 3 dollars has been taken off the share price dividends do not appear out of thin air dividends are accrued from the earnings and that reflects on the share price x dividend so my capital appreciation is going to be compromised in addition to lack of returns and that doesn't seem to make sense to me but the same coca cola was deemed worthy of investment by me during last year's covid crash because i know that come what may the chances of coca cola surviving this crash was much higher so i bought into it at small small amounts 40 to 47 dollar range and finally i disposed it of two months ago at 54 to 55 dollars got six quarter three to four quarters of dividends lost 30% on the dividends but now i booked the profit the profit has been booked because hanging on to coca cola from now may not be very very useful for me when compared to a us investor for the us investor the net worth would go from 55 to 60 in maybe one years or one years time with the dividends for me it will go from 45 to 47 that capital could be deployed elsewhere on a similar company let's go back to national grid then i will not be taxed for accruing or taking that dividend so for the us stocks dividend stocks i was not very keen except for that brief trading type thing which i did for us stocks seeking unbiased opinion is difficult one of the articles one of the sources was seeking alpha unfortunately seeking alpha is now a paid service and therefore Uh, i do not see any wisdom in going and uh, subscribing to seeking alpha or bloomberg or any of the paid services for that matter because i firmly believe it is not essential for some it may be essential but i do not think that the money justifies its worth i would rather learn the hard way stumble and make my own deduction by my own research singapore is my home market Singapore has got Business Times, which is the equivalent of the Financial Express, which is published daily. It's not great journalism, but it is very uh, matter of the fact. Opinions cannot cloud, and so I can take a decision on the basis of that. So these are the sources: my local newspaper for my uh, current home country, US and UK. I better go by the official version and then form my own conclusions. Thank you for that clarification. It seems like you are um, you have a main investing thesis or an approach, which is the either the mutual fund or dividend growth investing. Um, but also, uh, more recently, you're saying that you invest in much more opportunistic growth stock um, individual equity investment, like the example of um, Coca Cola. and is that just because of the opportunity that uh, that was presented to us from the covid crash or or do you have a different kind of um reasons or meaning behind um your particular kind of nuance uh, kind of uh, tweak to your style it was sheer opportunism on my point on my part 
that I utilize that mega dip to go in. But I am of cautious disposition and therefore I won't plunge headlong. I would rather lose a bit more money in uh, commissions and maybe lose a bit of uh, uh, upside, but rather take stepwise approaches. And throughout last year, I did it with the US stocks. But even with the US stocks, even with the US stocks, Apologies for the technical glitch. Um, hopefully, Dr. Um, Karthik should be able to join us um, soon. Um, just to ensure that um, when, when you join, just um, keep your microphone muted, please, uh, while listening. And uh, hopefully, we'll get some time to interact with Dr. Karthik um, towards the end of our meeting. If you have any kind of questions that you'd like to kind of me to ask uh, towards the end or during the interview, um, feel free to kind of add them to the chat section uh, while we are waiting for Dr. Karthik to join us again. Sorry about the technical glitch. Uh, we're back yeah. online. So getting, I'm really apologizing to everyone. Um, so getting back, sources of information have to be factual accounts without any bias. And we need to do our own work to get there. That would be the safer approach in the long term. I feel that's what helps. I have a question on that, Venkatesh, if that's all right. In terms of the facts, so we get the facts and numbers from those uh, resources you mentioned, but for for somebody new, uh, we have to start somewhere. So let's say someone starting out, and how how do they know how to interpret it? Because there is this. Sometimes we do see great earnings has been released, but the stock price um, plummets after that. Yeah. Uh, what are reason? Whether it's selling um, selling the rumor, buying uh, sorry buying the rumor and selling the new uh, news, or whether it's um, based on the forward guidance or an expectation of the vaccine being effective and the economy reopening, whatever it is, we may not necessarily know as a retail investor all of those things. How do you yeah. then you make your, make up your own mind based on the facts that you can? Yeah. So in the current era, there is very little asymmetry of information or what I can call gap between actual events and news except for insider events which we will never know and we will always have nasty surprises but for the beginner and i would consider that i am a beginner still because i am learning by my mistakes still there are two ways either you find your own path or if you find it very very difficult we need to be part of the groups like we are doing we are doing a very great uh, service to each other and this is one of the ways to learn wherein you can trust on what others feel. Of course, there is also another way out in that if you have somebody who can guide you, if you are part of an investor group, like in the US, there are paid investor groups, which um, are like investing clubs, actually, wherein they believe that collective wisdom helps. I always believe in collective wisdom and that's why I'm very keen and contribute to this group as much as I can because I learn a lot. I mean, I've learned a lot from you with regard to the technicals and other things. I never used to do technicals formally. I used to be just sort of a rough technical guy. So this is how we should all learn from each other. So I think Rome was not built in a day and no matter how much you guide somebody and uh, handhold somebody, it has to be at least 70 80 percent uh, effort from the uh, self self effort 20 percent is trusted sources collective wisdom and forums like this and then also you have to form your own opinion because at the end of the day harsh as it may sound it is your own hard-earned money and therefore it, it needs to be under the same of expectation if i am happy with four percent you shouldn't be influenced by me and saying, oh, he said 4%, then 4% is enough because my 
expectations are tempered by my experiences and by my innate nature whereas your innate nature is not going to be mine and your expectations as well as your projections in terms of what you expect may be higher and therefore if you follow me you may in the end not I mean, I won't say regret it. You may find a bit, well, I could have done better, that sort of a feeling. So there is no shortcut in my opinion. I think that's nicely leading on to the question I have in my mind, actually, in terms of the psychology. Um, because investment is um, the knowledge, the information that you gather is as important as the, the psychology um, for investment yes. journey. And um, one of the things that I really admire with your approach is how different it is from mine, because you spoke about um, National Grid and, and some of the other stocks which I have previously invested in um, with a dividend investment approach. But then when the dividend was cut, the price was going down. Um, it wasn't fitting with my kind of broader kind of investment um, outlook. Um, I didn't have the patience that you had. So I kind of shifted my um, approach to something different. So how did, um, so could you tell us, share some, something about the psychology that's behind this approach of yours. Um, it's, it's a real long term. You spoke about 25 years for one of the mutual funds. And of course, dividend investment investment goes on for decades, um, certainly. Um, could you share a little bit about um, yeah. psychological insight? As you all know, behavioral investing, behavior or behavioral investing is one of those uh, not so well studied, uh, uh, I would say, sciences. And we all know that we have two cardinal emotions of fear and greed, which tug us in opposite direction. Uh, the human psych, as, as a psychiatrist, I'm sure you would agree, pulls us more towards greed. But depending upon our innate personality, fear pulls you down. I am that sort of an individual wherein fear used to predominate and pull me down. And that was the reason why I went into dividend investing because dividends are supposed to put a floor for the share prices. That is the word they use. It puts a floor beneath the share price, which means when the dividend is pulled or cut, as you said, the share price will collapse and it does collapse. Because the, 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 the main motivation for someone to hold a share like national grid is the dividend. Why should I hold on to national grid when the whole investing hypothesis is being questioned by a dividend cut? That's true. But that is where discretion and patience both come in. Let me give one example. And this example I'm going to give you is one of my long holding shares, GlaxoSmithKline. For the last 10 to 12 years, I've held GlaxoSmithKline through thick and thin, through good and bad days, through three CEOs. I know that the dividend cut is looming on the horizon next year when the consumer division will be spin off from the pharma division and to earmark more funds for research and development, the pharma division will need more money. And so the only way out is a dividend cut. The dividends have been paid at 80 US cents per share in four installments of 20 cents each for the last God knows 10 to 12 years. Glaxo is not an ideal dividend investor candidate because it has not grown dividends. First point. Second point, dividend cover with three cash flow even plummeted below one like in the case of Vodafone, but now it is just over one, which means that the security of the dividend is under threat. Now, I know that a dividend cut is going to happen. The 80 cents is purported to become 55 to 60 cents, but I will not sell. And I will take the risk of holding on because of two reasons. First is I will wait for the dividend cut and I will wait for the weaker hands to sell out. The weaker hands and the dividend funds will sell out. And now the current price of around 1390 or 14 pounds will go down to 12 pounds and I will buy more. I will buy more of the company, which will then be split into two. And I have faith in this consumer division, which will be a cash cow. And that cash cow will become a fertile takeover candidate. And I will bank on that with dividends coming in between. 
I'm going to show you an example of the share chart and tell you why I will hold on when we go on to discuss individual companies. Bear with me until then. Second is discretion. In this case, what is the discretion for the dividend cut? Is this a dividend cut because they are suffering? The answer is no. Why is the share price not going up? The share price did not go up because A, they did not have blockbuster new drugs which are patentable. B, the COVID outbreak resulted in lower uptake of the shingles and influenza vaccination and everybody is diverted away in COVID and therefore the vaccine division suffered 25%. So the current plateau in earnings as well as even the recent bump in earnings has been much better than actually forecast. And that's why Glaxo's share price went up a bit. Now it's coming down for obvious reasons because of the splitting of the company. Now, where should you apply your discretion? The discretion should be applied. Is this the company taking a hard knock permanently? No. Has anything materially changed with the toothpaste and the Sensodyne toothpaste? No. Has anything changed with their influenza vaccine, their Shingrix? No. More people are growing older. Influenza vaccination rates are increasing worldwide. Shingles vaccination rates are increasing worldwide. Most of the developed countries have more older people than young people. So you have a demography as well as a product profile, which is reasonably safe. And therefore, it would be not a good choice to just panic and sell it out, but wait and see how the fellows sell off and then buy to 12 and lower, it, lower your average price further thereby enhancing your dividend yield. I will exemplify GlaxoSmithKline and the likes of that when I show charts. Next. Sorry, um, that's useful, um, useful to see as well in a minute. Um, maybe a question before then um, for you, Venkateshis. Um, you, I'm assuming that because you have to keep track of this kind of earnings report and the company progress fairly closely, um, you are probably main, maintaining a um, selected number of positions in the portfolio, not a large number of positions, like number of stocks. Um, what are your thoughts about how, how many stocks should one have in a portfolio for this particular approach um, to, in order to maintain a reasonable oversight of what's going on? That's an excellent question, and I will once again elaborate on it. I was originally following what you said you cannot bite off more than you chew and therefore have select number of well-chosen, beautiful, fundamental blue chip stocks and then hold on and keep researching them and then make money. Sadly, sadly, it did not work well for me. Although people say diversification is diversification, I would beg to agree or disagree on that front. I'll tell you why. My investments were primarily limited to the UK before I moved to Singapore. All hand-picked blue chips which were helping me and rewarding me except for one or two were affected by not only Brexit, but also by COVID subsequently and they have not recovered. As I often post, a long-standing suffering shareholder of HSBA, Stan and Lloyd, right? So if I had limited my choices to HSBA, Stan and Lloyd, my banking portfolio would be bleeding badly now. It is still bleeding, but I compensated that by entering the banking industry in Singapore, the three primary banks of Singapore, DBS, OCBC, and UOB, and the four primary US banks, JPM, C, BAC, and WFC. So here, how did diversification help me? Diversification actually helped me offset the Brexit and COVID associated losses in the UK and US and Singapore saved me, which brings you to the most important point. Diversify across sectors, diversify across geographies, diversify across currencies, diversify across asset classes. However long it takes, it's hard work, but that is the only way. So. The short answer to your question is no, I have multiple number of companies with small holdings in many of them and significant holdings in a small number of them. And my plan is to even it out and make sure that 
nothing is more than 3% or 4% of my total portfolio nothing should be more than 3% of my total portfolio however hard it can get however tempting it may be because we are faced with several uncertainties i will tell you what i fear most people will laugh at me and people are still laughing at me i fear us china military clash that will be worse than the covid i fear a taiwan or a hong kong related problem with armed thing god forbid it happens i hope it doesn't if that happens and you are not sectorally diversified you will take a 90% or 80% hit whereas if you take this you may get a 60% hit maybe i am paranoid but i have changed my approach in the last 5 years or 6 years to diversifying across geographies i have gone into hong kong and australia and india as well and i will spread my results uh, my 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 butter very thin i'm okay i think it's a nice a nice um nice thing for all of us to to hear that diversification is not always diversification and and also diversify across multiple layers geographies currencies sector industries so that's a that's a nice point to to um to share thank you um i suppose now we can move on to you wanted to share some um uh, web page and also um talk it through and soon after we'll talk about um any words of wisdom any mistakes um before we finish i will share my um the uh, hosting privilege with you to share the screen and then before the end i have a couple of slides to show so you can um uh, share the host back to me if that's all right okay so friends now what i'm going to do is a yeah, a sort of a non formal presentation of how things have been in my case over a few different uh, groups of industries belonging to different geographies so we will look at different sectors starting from the most maligned sector and no prizes for guessing that will be oil and gas so i am going to try to see if i can show you something on my share screen model so you have to be a bit patient with me and i'm trying now to share screen can i can i ask you if you can see the 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 chart there yeah we can we can see that royal dutch shell royal dutch shell one of my darlings which hasn't kept most people in the world happy never sell shell goes the old adage which sadly was broken for the second time in the last 75 years first dividend cut was during the second world war and the second dividend cut was covid 2020 last year i'm going to now tell you two things okay i is not at the door go 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 so uh, the the purpose of my showing this slide is the worst affected sector due to a combination or a toxic cocktail of covid uh, esg related concerns and uh, several of the global warming type issues is oil and gas royal dutch shell okay my average holding price before all this pre brexit was around 2050 or 2075 somewhere around that without including any dividends or anything now on face of it i have lost 6 pounds for every share looks very 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 bad on paper right before this time from where i am showing you the chart i have held it from 2011 in 2011 as i navigate across the chart i don't know if you can see my live navigation yeah my live navigation shows you 1920 23 so my 
average price took somewhere around that so i held it for 5 years pre brexit and now 5 years post brexit post brexit everything was reasonably okay until the oil price collapse everything happened and then the covid came and then things went south very very fast hmm. now on paper there is a 6 pound loss per share but the fact is over the period of this 11 years until the dividend cut for 10 years let's make it easy i got 1 dollar 88 cents 188 us cents per share per year 188 over 10 years is 18 dollars 80 cents per share 18 dollars 80 cents per share averaging the usd gbp exchange rate over this 10 year period would be approximately around 12 pounds right so the actual amount of cash that accrued to me would be 14 plus 12 26.5 minus 20.5 which is 6 pounds plus per share okay what is the alternate risk free please do not tell me you had put it in apple you would be a millionaire that is not the right comparison i should compare this against opportunity cost which would be a fixed deposit in british pound or something like that and you would see that actually despite my capital loss on paper it is 6 dollars up but what i didn't tell you during this course is that when the price started plummeting at 2020 20 i started buying at 1750 finished my buying at 1150 and now i got double the amount of shares what i bought for uh, with a, for 2050 if i say i had x shares for 2020 i bought 2x shares at the average price of 14.15 i checked all my records before i started this presentation so for the 2x i am already in cash and i have harvested two dividends for the x i have lost six but in that 11 year period i have made up six so overall you calculate that and i leave it to your discretion to see how much of positive generation has happened with this patient dividend investing approach this is the worst possible share next let me move on to something which didn't bear the brunt of all this selling and you will see what my thing is you all recognize this manchunians liverpoolians mm -hmm. united utilities is the largest listed water company in the uk trading at over 10 pounds since brexit it's exactly at where it was 10 pounds hold it for 10 years and kept on buying now and then and then 10 years you are looking at around 2011 was about 6 pounds or 7 pounds my average price worked out to about 7 and 1/2 8 pounds i added a very small amount since i didn't have much cash during last year's crash and now it stands at 1038 hmm. so united utilities has increased its dividend almost every year without fail except for one or two years of plateauing in the last 10 years once again the government allows a rate a rate of allowed internal return which has been fixed and this goes for a 5 year period from 2022 to 2027 the minute the 2022 results came out the share price jumped and you get earnings visibility and i added to my holdings now why is united utilities going up it's going up because it's a safety thing like national grid these are bond proxies so now you imagine you buy something for 10 pounds 5 years ago get about 35 40 pence dividend every year which is about 4 and 1/2 to 5 and 1/2 percent dividend yield right so you are making about effectively 40 cents every year and within about 2 3 years you made around 2 to 250 compounded so your 10 became 250 1250 250 divided by 5 what's your annualized return your annualized return for the most pedestrian share which is safe from all the esg onslaughts is 6 to 
until they find a viable replacement for H2O, United Utilities will tend to remain stable unless they do major blunders. Of course, debt is an issue because it's an infrastructure related company and they will need to keep on servicing, keep good customer relationships, keep on repairing the pipes and this and that. But that's all part of the deal. You have to pay a price. So once again, United Utilities demonstrates the same. Same thing is also shown by another of my holdings, SSE, Scottish and Southern Energy. Almost a similar chart. And the readers might remember that about seven, eight months ago, I posted about SSE and I said, I am waiting for it to go below 14. Sadly, it went to 14.50 and I was indecisive and it went back to 16 plus. Mm. Okay. These three shares, SSE, NG and UU are three boring utilities, of which SSE is a bit risky because of other reasons, which I won't elaborate now. But these are like sort of standard companies. So I showed you uh, the worst stock oil. I talked about two utilities, one for gas, electricity, and one for water. And I showed how dividend investing and being patient and compounding the dividend. The last point is very important. Works. You don't have to compound it in the same share. You can take the NG dividend and put it in UU. The UU price is OK and add in fresh funds and so Next, I would say the next company I'm going to show is once again illustrating the pitfalls of my approach, which is a mistake which I didn't do, but circumstances did for me. Long-standing shuffering shareholder of HSBC. My average price, you will all laugh at me, six pounds, right? Held through thick and thin for the last 10 to 12 years. Now, I have lost 45%. Even with the fat dividends they used to dole out before the uh, COVID, when I adjusted, I am still down by about maybe 15% or 20%. How do I make amends for it? I need to make an attempt to make amends for it only if I believe in the future of HSBC. Whether I should believe or not is a matter of discussion for another day. Mm -hmm. But I was a bit cautious. And that's why day before yesterday, I put when somebody said buy Lloyds, I think Deeraj pointed out buy Lloyds. By all means, uh, it's a good buy. But I said I would be cautious about the three British banks, including even uh, Standard Chartered, because I am a bit uncertain about their long term part. So what should I do now? What I have decided to do is that I will not do anything now and I will see how Noel Quinn steers the ship over the next three to four quarters. HSBC is now suffering from the lowest interest rate. HSBC is suffering from the US-China uh, Cold War. HSBC is suffering because of its overexposure to US operations. Thankfully, they have cut the loss and come out. They are going to come out of France as well. And therefore, it's a cautious case. So should I attempt to repair my 15 to 20% and put money in and average down further? Will it become good money thrown in on a bad thing in retrospect? The answer is I don't know. But what I did last year, I'll tell you. Last year, through the Hong Kong exchange, I bought a small amount of HSBC to attempt to average it. And so my paper loss is about 15 to 20% maybe. When will I be breathing a sign of relief? Sigh of relief? that's when they start to restore their dividend fully. Now they have restored some amount. They are using this to bloody kitchen sink. I'm sorry for swearing, but they have enough money. Their CET1 ratio is north of 14.5%, which means they can easily indulge in buybacks, which they should do now when the price is low, but they are dragging their feet. And that's the reason why I said, be cautious with HSBC. So this is an example of a banking industry titan wherein the dividend approach did not work. So how did I make amends for it? I made amends for it with the next chart, which I will show you. Please feel free to interrupt me if it is, sounds boring, but uh, we, my approach is, my approach maybe is we boring. Can, we, can, we can have a look at the next chart. There's a question by the um, one of the members as well, and then we can yeah, try. I think um, we can, we can look at this chart. We can look at this chart, and then I will take the question, and then we will resume. Yeah. So this is the local hero DBS, which is Development Bank of Singapore, which is uh, which has won several accolades for one of the best banks in the whole of the world in terms of customer relationship, digitalization. They are leading the pack. I have bought HSDBS 
steadily over the last 6 to 7 years since i relocated here my average price was somewhere in the region now of around after all the buys last year during the covid crisis around somewhere around 21 22 not even more than that and now you can see that with the opening up of the economy even with ultra low interest rates it is at 30 25 this offers a dividend yield of anywhere between 3 and 5% of course there was a 40% dividend cut mandated by our government so therefore we had less dividends but that has been lifted since then so this one makes up for this if dravid didn't score lakshman needs to score if lakshman doesn't score at least ashwin should score down the line so you have a pack even within the same industry by diversifying across geography even within the same sector i will stop here and we will take the question before i go on to more exciting graphs uh, thank you ankesh could you also maybe um change the host back to me as well thank you um one of the question that um the members have asked and and i guess all of us perhaps have in our mind is how do you decide when to sell you gave a couple of examples of your cautiously watching certain stocks and um clearly you're a long term investor and you're still holding on to some of the weaker performance uh, as well as well but are there times are there any particular predetermined price targets that you work with or um uh, certain company specific or price action specific criteria that needs to be met for you to sell yeah i think this is a very very great question you know that's asked where there is an entry there needs to be an exit plan for at least most of the stocks if not all the stocks and that exit plan will be determined by a your circumstances and also b by the individual stock specific issues a let us talk about circumstances circumstances are wherein you need it need the money for something else and you exit and therefore if you are happy with the profit you make you exit that is straight forward you are buying a house you want 20000 pounds more because it will be easier to get a lower interest mortgage you just uh, sell your national grid uh, you are happy with your 15% gain total absolute finish end of the story that's easy then you can always justify your selling and you will never feel guilty right the next is the actual selling price determination of something wherein you intend to reinvest that is the most difficult thing so exit followed by reinvest would be difficult and therefore has to be done in two ways either you decide i will sell at this price because i am happy with the returns and i will use the money elsewhere i will give you one example coca cola once again back to my example 45 to 46 dollar average entry price 54 to 55 dollar exit price holding period was not predetermined but when you see sideways movement when coca cola hits about 53 54 after vaccination doesn't move up doesn't move down you exit then you have made that 10 dollars per share maybe if you have got say 40 shares or 50 shares you made a 500 dollar after charges say 484 90 dollars be happy that is okay but that exit has to be timed with an equally good entry plan which would mean that if you are okay to take some risk that if you are okay to take that sort of a stand let us do something i invested 45 into 40 or 1800 dollars i got out with uh, say 15 to 40 uh, 2200 dollars that 2200 will go into a steady boring dividend stock like a real estate investment trust or like something like united utilities so i have what i call up cycling which means i cycle down up with my profit into a what i construe as a more stable but boring company and thereby compound my dividend how do i compound my dividend had i stuck with coca cola i am going to get after dividend with holding tax 3% dividend i made this profit i enter into united utilities i will get a 5% dividend intact instead of the 3% so my yield on cost improves by 2% or actually 40% in absolute terms provided neither of the two appreciate in price capital wise so that is exit strategy first time 
second exit strategy is something which i would not advise is you think a share has gone up too high let's get out of it and it's a fundamentally good company and instead of allowing your winners to run you exit and panic i made that mistake by exiting facebook last year at 280 thinking oh my god something is going to happen and then you listen to all the news uh, the big four will be regulated by the us senate and uh, bernie sanders will come after all the people and raid them for uh, feeding the poor and all that i exited and i wanted to enter again at 260 right this was a mistake on my part retrospectively because it never came down to 260 and stayed but instead has gone down to 330 340 now after going up to 360 second exit wherein i did not have a proper strategy misfired the second strategy exit misfired the first exit fired properly so exiting is not always a very full proof option and it has to be dealt with particularly when we have taxes to pay and when you are going to trigger off a tax event by exiting because of the capital gains you make you think not once but twice thrice this brings me back to the original hypothesis wherein i go for big boring blue chip companies wherein the chances of collapsing are very less wherein i can hold on to them and probably postpone the short term capital gains into long term capital gains thank you that's a wonderful answer um Uh, could could you also stop sharing the screen as well so we can and um yeah how do i do that i just uh, stop share right yeah stop stop share, share yeah. and um change back the host back to me if that's all right please how how um, should i do that so if you go to the participants um um choose more on my name and then um transfer host or make host or something like that make host make host yes yeah Okay. Chain. Oh, oh, sorry. Don't kick me out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just give me a minute. Yeah. I, I, that, that's a great answer, Ankit. Thank you. It, uh, so, in in a nutshell, the way I understood it is um, useful to have an exit strategy, but that depends on the um, the trade strategy with which you enter that particular stock um, or a mutual fund. Um, and the other um, other aspect to think about is what are you going to do with that money when you sell. do you have yeah. any need need for it is that a better place where you can dispose that money to whether it's an investment or personal use um uh, and if the initial original thesis is still valid and you don't need the money then keep it keep it going this is how is how um how i understood it thank you that's, yes. that's nice that's great um any final words of wisdom ankitesh for for us well i wouldn't say a words of wisdom because i don't consider that uh i have done many wise things because that's where all my mistakes will come in and i will i have already cataloged a few of my mistakes i will first start with the mistakes and then tell you what i learned from it because it's important to learn from others mistakes first mistake is lack of continuity in my early investing career because time is your best friend and time with compounding maximizes the returns so i frittered off around 5 to 10 years early on because i was busy doing other things i don't feel guilty about it because uh, that is the circumstances of life everybody's uh, had to go through and that's fine so that's actually not a real mistake but for those people who are relatively free and have the time and temperament please do not uh, let go please do not uh, uh, stop after a bad fall or a bad experience because uh, it, it is difficult to make up in terms of time the second mistake i made is becoming fixated on dividends or what's called yield chasing yield chasing has cost me badly how did it cost me badly it cost me badly when i went throwing good money after bad companies enticed by the headline figure yield early in my career example the worst loser in my career centrica the famous british gas it is one of the it is the biggest loser yield chasing second yield chasing associated mistake was the singapore telephone company star hub thankfully i cut losses had i held on to that i would have lost a more amount big big amounts i have lost and then there were a few unintentional mistakes which i made because of lack of diversification that is the third mistake i did not diversify outside the uk early 
I did not touch the United States growth stocks at that point of time and got fixated on the UK. So home bias, this is the mistake which I made. Home bias is to be avoided at all costs. Then the next mistake, which I am guilty of doing even now, right, is that I am not able to shake off my conservative dividend type things. And many of you might have even a bit got irritated about the charts that I showed. They are they're extremely boring stuff, although they may have helped me. And I am continuing to have that conservative bent of mind. So being risk averse, which would that I'm trying to change that by starting to research the NASDAQ 100 stocks. I am also being cautious there and I'll go only for the well-capitalized top stocks, including the mega cap techs. So I was late to the game. And then another mistake I did is the concept of exchange traded funds, low cost funds, exchange traded funds is something which I just ignored early on until last year when I started to invest in the Vanguard ETF for the FTSE 100 and the Nifty ETF for the Mumbai Stock Exchange. The last mistake that I am doing now is to ignore cryptocurrencies. Krish must be listening and chuckling somewhere. And I know it's hard for me. I'm finding it very hard to put my head around. Not that I don't understand it, I do understand it, but my skepticism and my suspicious uh, feel about it is preventing me from taking and any step in that direction. And instead, I'm trying to, uh, you know, skirt around that by entering JP Morgan, PayPal and st stuff like that, trying to get an indirect foothold so that I don't feel guilty in the future, right? So these are the six or seven mistakes that I committed. But I'm thankful that I have had that insight about the mistakes that I'm doing. And although despite insight, I, I'm struggling to change, I will definitely do that if there is a correction, which is going to happen imminently. And I've been saying for the last two months, I know everybody's laughing, but that will come sometime and that will be a time to correct these mistakes. Yeah, I think the market has been a bit um, icky recently and then a bit twitchy um, as well, um, particularly how it finished the last last week. So something to watch for all of us. Um, thank you, Venkatesh, for your time and your um, sharing your life journey, uh, investment journey and your wisdom as well. I just want to share one final slide before we um, close off this meeting. Um, could could you transfer the host? I, I don't have the privilege. How host do I privilege click? Sense. I'm trying. I can see. I'm I'm struggling with it. There is a there is a. It says multiple participants can share simultaneously. I can click on that. Then uh, you should be able to share. Or is there a make host? Um, I, I, the make host is available for the rest of the viewers, but for you, I don't know how to do it. I'm really sorry. I'm trying to go to the thing. It says multiple participants can share simultaneously. I can click that. Okay, try that one. Has that been chosen? Yeah, I click yeah. that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I can I can share screen. So I just want to share this slide, um, a disclaimer slide. I think it's important um, to put this on because we were very open in discussing um, personal experiences in this um, conversation, um, mentioning various companies, stocks, and things like that. So it's important to um, uh, recognize this disclaimer, which always exists, but to also make it explicit that this material is intended for personal sharing and educational purposes only and not to be recommend, not um, to be considered as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instruments or products. Do not, uh, they do not constitute any investment advice either. Do your own due diligence, make your own decisions. Value, value of your investments can rise as well as for capitalists at risk when investing in any financial products. You get back less than you invest, um, you could um, in, in the investment world. Past performances are not guaranteed to future performance. None of what you heard today is uh, representative of any particular firm. I mean, Grow Wealth is um, the kind of sponsor. Um, it's not um, the company's uh, viewpoint or my own viewpoint. 
um, the guest speakers share their own personal experiences that should not be considered as advice it's their, um, their own personal experience um, please um, do your own kind of research and, and make up your own mind um, certain services were, was also mentioned um, subscription services and stuff again they represent individual views and not to be subscribed or come off the subscription just based on what you heard here i just want to um, just register it there and um, I, the, the Zoom, uh, all of that is sponsored by Grow Wealth. So I thought I'll put this slide in there as well. Happy learning and successful investing. Good luck. We will continue our conversation in our Telegram group. Um, I think we can stop our recording um, right now. Thanks, Vinod, once again for giving me the chance. And uh, thanks, friends, for listening in. And please feel free to give your uh, constructive critic and how uh, you would interpret and your own thoughts and let's make this forum much more active and lively thank yeah. you and uh, Venkatesh, i think you could um stop the recording on your side i couldn't do it on this side. yeah i stopped recording yeah